This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. A federal judge ruled today that Google has violated U.S. antitrust laws with its search business. The decision has the potential to reshape how millions of Americans get information online and could put an end to Google's dominance. The company has spent tens of billions of dollars on exclusive contracts to secure a dominant position as the world's default search provider on smartphones and web browsers. The government said those contracts help block rivals such as Microsoft's Bing and DuckDuckGo. It is unclear what penalties Google may face. Another hearing will likely determine that. So far, no reaction from the tech giant. Tropical storm Debbie downgraded from hurricane status hits Florida's Big Bend coast. It's causing a dangerous storm surge and serious flooding as it moves north across the state. NTD's Christina Corona has the update. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency Monday for 61 counties anticipated to be impacted by the storm. The storm is expected to move through north central Florida and into Georgia and the Carolinas. Sunday and Monday morning, the storm impacted the west coast of Florida, starting in the southwest and continuing up the coast. This storm has produced and will likely produce uh, significant flooding events from Sarasota Bradenton area all the way up to northern Florida. Uh, we have 3,000 service members from the Florida National Guard that are on standby, uh, and that includes search and rescue, route clearance, distribution, and protection of critical infrastructure. The maximum sustained winds for Debbie have reached 80 miles an hour with higher gusts throughout the storm area and leaving more than 300,000 energy customers without power. Florida's Gulf Coast faces severe flooding from heavy rains, with some areas already getting over 10 inches and expecting up to 20 inches more. The Florida Division of Emergency Management has completed 435 storm-related missions and they are currently in the process of completing 400 more. As of Monday afternoon, Noon, at least four deaths have been confirmed due to the storm. According to the Levi County Sheriff's Office, a 13-year-old boy died Monday morning after a tree fell on a mobile home located southwest of Gainesville, Florida. Deputies confirmed the death of the teenage boy who was crushed inside the home. A truck driver also died early Monday on Interstate 75 in the Tampa area after he lost control of his tractor trailer. It flipped over a concrete wall and dangled over water before the cab dropped into the water below. East of Stainhatchee, Florida, a 38-year-old woman and a 12-year-old boy were killed late Sunday when her car hit a median and overturned on a wet road. Coast Guard crews also rescued two sailors from a 34-foot vessel 73 miles off Boca Grande on Sunday. But crews are inspecting the areas for potential damage. Thus far, 150 FDOT crews have assessed over 8,400 lane miles for damages. 69 bridge inspection as inspectors uh, teams are in the field and have performed over 1,300 inspections. As soon as the storm passes, DeSantis says points of distribution will be available for residents in need of assistance or resources. Christina Corona, NTD News. In international news, Bangladesh's Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has resigned and fled the country. It comes after anti-government protesters stormed her residence, capping weeks of demonstrations. Hundreds of people have been killed since demonstrations began in July. What began as a peaceful protest over job quotas turned violent and swelled into a movement demanding that Hasina step down. Police and the military attacked protesters and used tear gas to disperse large crowds gathered in the capital. At a news conference earlier today, the army chief announced the prime minister's resignation and said Bangladesh's military now plans to form an interim government. The United Nations today called for restraint and urged the interim government to be democratic. Leaked documents show disagreement among Israeli officials and the Israel Defense Forces confirmed the deaths of two terrorist leaders. NTD's Fiona G has the latest Middle East updates. Leaked records over the weekend show disagreements between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and heads of Israel's domestic and foreign intelligence agencies. The officials say they believe they could reach a ceasefire deal if Netanyahu lets go of some of his demands, which the prime minister is refusing to do. 
According to Lebanon's Ministry of Health, an Israeli airstrike Monday killed two people in Lebanon. Strikes on two schools being used as shelters in Gaza City reportedly killed at least 30 people Sunday. Israeli officials say the attacks targeted and killed Jabir Aziz, commander of Hamas's al Khan battalion and a major organizer of the October 7th attack. The IDF confirmed that a strike by the Israeli Air Force today killed Elijah Mal Aldwin Jawad in southern Lebanon. He was a commander in Hezbollah's Radwan force. Israeli officials say his death is a significant blow to Hezbollah's operational capabilities. As fears over an escalation in the conflict rise, diplomatic efforts continue. Jordan's foreign minister visited Iran Sunday and met with Iran's acting foreign minister. This marks the first visit of a Jordanian official to Iran in two decades. President Biden spoke with King Abdullah of Jordan on Monday. They discussed efforts to reach a ceasefire and hostage release deal. Meanwhile, the commander of U.S. Central Command spoke with Israel's chief of the general staff. The officials discussed strategic and security plans for the Middle East. Biden is convening his national security team Monday afternoon to discuss developments in the Middle East. The United Nations today fired nine staff members from its Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. The UN said they may have been involved in the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. Meanwhile, the US, France, UK and other countries are warning citizens to leave Lebanon after recent strikes in northern Israel and Beirut. The US Embassy in Lebanon told Americans to leave on any available ticket. Fiona G, NTD News. In an update today from the Department of State on the region's conflicts, a spokesperson talked about Secretary of State Antony Blinken's stance on the issue. Earlier today, Secretary Blinken spoke to Qatari Prime Minister Al Thani and Egyptian Foreign Minister Abdullahi about tensions in the Middle East, the latest in a series of diplomatic engagements he has held over the past few days with counterparts in the region and around the world, including calls yesterday with G7 Foreign Ministers and Iraqi Prime Minister Sudani. The Secretary has delivered a consistent message in all of these engagements. We are at a critical moment for the region, and it is important that all parties take steps over the coming days to refrain from escalation and calm tensions. Escalation is in no one's interest. The Department of State emphasized the impact of the war on the lives of innocent civilians, saying that an escalation is not inevitable. The spokesperson reiterated U.S. support for the defense of Israel, but said he believes a ceasefire is in the best interest of all parties involved. He also encouraged U.S. citizens to evacuate from Lebanon. Next, in the United Kingdom, riots continue to affect cities across the nation. Protesters set fire to cars and hotels, while police and the government seek to subdue the disorder. NTD's Malcolm Hudson has the details from London. Anti-immigration protests and riots continue in Britain, one week on from the Southport stabbings. The government has called an emergency response meeting after two hotels, which were reportedly used to house asylum seekers, were set on fire over the weekend. Protesters threw bricks at police and broke hotel windows in Rotherham, Northern England. Local police said at least 10 officers were injured during confrontations with a crowd of 700 people. The hotel was the site of smaller protests in 2023. Multiple towns and cities across England and Northern Ireland saw police clash with crowds amid escalating violence. The widespread disorder broke out in the wake of a knife attack last week, which killed three girls and left more injured. British Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer on Sunday promised those involved in the unrest would face the full force of the law. The government has faced calls for the army to be called in, but ministers have so far insisted police have the resources needed to respond. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Ukrainian pilots have started flying F-16 jets for operations within the nation. It is a milestone for Ukraine, although it remains unclear how many are available. The jets had been on Ukraine's wish list for a long time because of their destructive power and global availability. They are equipped with a 20 millimeter cannon and can carry bombs, rockets and missiles. Zelensky said the country still didn't have enough jets or pilots, but he said many soldiers are now undergoing training. Russia has been targeting bases that may house F-16s and vowed to shoot them down. Vice President Kamala Harris's team interviewed at least three potential VP picks over the weekend, and she's expected to make her decision public before the start of a week-long campaign tour that kicks off tomorrow in Pennsylvania. 
NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on this story. Vice President Kamala Harris met with her top three VP contenders over the weekend. She met with Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, with Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, and Tim Waltz, the governor of Minnesota. Senator Mark Kelly was first elected in 2020 in a special election to complete the remainder of the late Senator John McCain's term in Arizona. A former Navy captain, Gulf War veteran, and NASA astronaut who piloted the last mission of the space shuttle program, Senator Kelly is married to former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who survived an assassination attempt in 2011. Kamala Harris has been across the country, you know, for the last, you know, week, you know, meeting with the American people. She's, she's, a, she's available, accessible. Kamala Harris is the candidate of the future for this country. She wants to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, make uh, child care affordable, reduce the cost of health care for the American people. Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania is a former attorney general and shares a background as a prosecutor with Vice President Kamala Harris. Governor Shapiro was elected in Pennsylvania in 2022 and beat then Republican Doug Mastriano by double digits. Shapiro, raised in a Jewish household, has called for an immediate two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and has been a strong critic of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Winning Pennsylvania will be critical to reach 270 electoral votes. She is obviously uniquely aware of the importance of picking someone uh, who she can run with and win with and, of course, govern with. And I know she will make this decision, as she makes every decision, in the best interest of the American people. Governor Tim Walz of Minnesota rose to top VP contender for the Democratic ticket after criticizing former President Donald Trump and vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance in a video clip that went viral. Tim Walls is a former educator, Army National Guard veteran, and former U.S. congressman with strong ties to labor organizations in the Midwest. Vice President Kamala Harris and her VP pick will make their first joint public appearance Tuesday evening at Temple University in Philadelphia before kicking off a week-long tour through the battleground states. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. As Vice President Kamala Harris interviewed her potential running mates this weekend, former President Trump campaigned in battleground Georgia. He's also proposing a new debate. NTD's Iris Tao has more from Atlanta. Former President Trump and Senator J.D. Vance holding a rally here in what Trump calls Deep Blue Atlanta. It's the same exact stadium where Vice President Kamala Harris just days ago held her largest rally to date. Trump also speaking to a packed house vows to win the battleground state of Georgia. Because if we lose Georgia, we lose the whole thing and our country goes to hell. In 2020, President Biden won Georgia by fewer than 12,000 votes. But now Trump has been consistently leading here in the polls. Nice. Speaking to voters here, Trump highlighting the issue of crime in Atlanta. Just a few weeks ago, two 13-year-old boys were murdered and an 11-year-old was shot. Trump also brought up Lakin Riley, a student who was killed this year while jogging at the University of Georgia. But Harris's campaign on Saturday fired back is targeting Trump over him backing out of an ABC debate originally scheduled for September 10th between Trump and Biden. The Harris campaign is accusing Trump of being afraid to face off with Harris. In a post, Trump cited ongoing lawsuits in announcing the reversal, but also opted for a new Fox News debate on September 4th. Harris's campaign has not agreed to the new debate. Starting on Tuesday and throughout next week, Harris will be campaigning with her VP pick across battleground states, and Trump will hold a rally in Montana this upcoming coming Friday. Reporting from Atlanta, Georgia, Iris Tao, and he did Turning now to Trump's legal battles, the Supreme Court has rejected a lawsuit brought by Missouri's Attorney General against the state of New York. The suit requested that the gag order in the former president's New York criminal case be lifted and his sentencing be delayed. In the D.C. election case, a federal judge has rejected Trump's effort to have the case dismissed. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards brings us the update. Missouri's Republican Attorney General Andrew Bailey attempted to file a lawsuit against New York. He claimed the gag order issued by Judge Juan Mershon violates the First Amendment rights of the voters in his state because they are unable to hear Trump speak. New York Attorney General Letitia James argued in a filing that allowing Missouri to sue would permit a dangerous end run around Trump's court proceedings. She rejected Missouri's filing as an attempt to interfere with the enforcement of criminal law in New York. The Supreme Court rejected the lawsuit without comment. However, the brief order noted Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito 
would have allowed the lawsuit to be filed, but, quote, would not grant other relief. Trump is scheduled to be sentenced next month after being convicted of 34 counts of falsifying business records tied to hush money payments to an adult film actress. And in the federal election case, Judge Tanya Chutkin on Saturday rejected the former president's effort to have the case dismissed. She tossed out an argument that Trump is being unfairly prosecuted. In a statement, Chutkin wrote, Trump is not being prosecuted for questioning the results, but for making what she called false statements and the obstruction of proceedings. Trump earlier argued the case was brought against him because he pleaded not guilty in the classified documents case. But Chutkin dismissed that argument as well. The next hearing will be on August 16th. Arlene Richards, NTD News. It's the worst day for the stock market in the past two years. The disappointing U.S. jobs report and Japan's recent interest rate hike are creating a domino effect as stocks fall worldwide. The tech sector is being hit especially hard, and U.S. crude oil closes at a six-month low. NTD's Melina Weisskup reports. Moments after the opening bell, a steady decline in the stock market, although now indices recovered a bit from their session lows. The Dow plunged 2.7 percent, the S&P 500 fell 3.2 percent, and the Nasdaq composite sank by 3.7 percent. A sell-off, some say, is a natural reaction to the disappointing jobs report last Friday and overvalued investments in the tech sector. That got people worried that the U.S. economy is slowing down more than anticipated. 114,000 jobs were added last month, way below expectations, coupled with an unexpected increase in the unemployment rate, 4.3 percent. That's the highest rate since October of 2021. While fears of recession loom, some say we're not quite there yet. Might show GDP growth in the U.S. less than 2 percent, but that's not the end of the world. That's modest growth. Um, we don't expect that recession. The unfavorable outlook of the U.S. economy caused a domino effect around the globe, hitting Japan the hardest. Following the Bank of Japan's rate hike, the market in Tokyo experienced its biggest drop in Japan's history. The Nikkei 225 index of leading stocks in Tokyo lost a staggering 4,451 points. Japan is definitely the market being affected the most, but there are also other tech uh, savvy uh, markets such as South Korea and Taiwan also suffer a bit of the loss after reaching the uh, new high um, in the past few months. Monday's plunge seen in the tech sector specifically. NVIDIA, known for its computer chips and AI supplies, was down 6 percent, and Apple fell almost 5 percent. Jobs in the tech industry are also down. Over 100,000 tech jobs were cut so far this year. Even amid the economic uncertainty and global sell-off, analysts are advising investors not to panic. I would say be careful about selling too much simply because this may not last. If, however, we see very serious indications of recession, the Federal Reserve has maintained an elevated 5.5 percent interest rate, and some are calling for an emergency cut. Others say an emergency isn't needed since the Fed says it's prepared to cut rates in September. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskop, NTD News. Earlier, we spoke with Daniel Lacaye, chief economist at Tresses and author of Freedom or Equality, about the stock market plunge, what's behind the mass sell-off, and what should the Federal Reserve be doing next? Daniel Lacaye, thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you back on the show. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Now, Daniel, to begin, what do you think is behind the scare this morning, fundamentally? Well, what we have seen is a combination of much weaker economic figures than expected, uh, a perception of market participants that central banks would cut rates much faster than they're actually doing, and the level of excess taken on expectations of a big bounce on technology and on Asian markets uh, after a correction that happened a week and a half ago. So those three elements 
developments basically have uh, driven to a sentiment going from prudent to uh, fearsome and at the same time a uh, level of unwinding of trades that were very very aggressively indebted uh, because of losses accumulated and therefore uh, creating the market slump that we have seen today and that is why it's it has been particularly strong and particularly aggressive in, in Japan. Hmm. Speaking of Japan, how does Japan factor into the market plunge we're seeing here in the U.S.? Well, uh, you probably remember that the Bank of Japan has tried to maintain some level of support on the yen, which fell to 40-year lows recently, and has had to intervene at least once with aggressive measures. That means basically selling dollars and buying yens. You may also remember that the Bank of Japan has been one of the main buyers of ETFs, of equity traded funds in the Japanese stock market in the past years. By becoming the largest buyer of ETFs and at the same time having to intervene to support the yen, it has basically created an enormous tsunami in which the uh, impact has been very aggressive and very immediate. The marginal buyer of those ETFs has disappeared and therefore the slump has been much larger. And the initial measures to contain the yen have failed and therefore that impact has generated a very significant uh, backlash and very significant impact as well on other Asian markets and other uh, economies in which the uh, exposure of Japanese uh, pension funds and in which the exposure of those investors that are looking for an allegedly stable trade in the yen have had to unwind very, very quickly. And in terms of the U.S. market scare this morning, how much did Friday's job report have to do with it? It was very significant because the, the Friday jobs report basically uh, showed to the American uh, investor and to the global investor that the concept of a soft landing, that the idea that the U.S. economy was going to be stronger for longer, that jobs were gains were very, very strong month on month and that there was absolutely nothing that would drive the economy slower, basically broke last, uh, last Friday. The jobs report was atrocious, and uh, basically then a lot of investors thought, oh gosh, then a rate cut from the Federal Reserve is not going to be enough. Hmm? And this is the big risk. No, the big risk is that the Federal Reserve may be behind the curve and may be behind the data and uh, acting with data that basically talks about the past, the GDP figure, the jobs report of the previous month, etc. Instead of the deterioration of the macroeconomic data. So I think that a lot of investors looked at the jobs report knowing that at best the Federal Reserve is going to make one rate cut in 2024 and thought this is not going to be enough. This is not going to be enough. We need a lot more of Federal Reserve support in order to prevent a much, a much more significant slowdown. And they basically also saw that the deterioration in the jobs market was very aggressive and very quick coming from a jobs report in the previous month that looked uh, at least in headline, quite positive, when it wasn't actually, because one third basically came from government jobs. Hmm. Now, investors seem to be betting that the Federal Reserve will respond with more aggressive rate cuts. Now, Bloomberg's Marcus Ashworth is arguing that that would be a mistake. Sh what should the Fed do now? Uh, the, the Fed is caught between a rock and a hard place. If it doesn't act, the likelihood of the market reacting even more aggressively is significant and this creates a relevant level of impact on commercial banks on pension funds etc the the market expectations of a no recession no hard landing economy is one of the biggest let's say uh, feeble arguments driving uh, equities no so if the if the fed doesn't act then the market may continue to slump and generate ripple effects into the real economy
However, if the Federal Reserve decides to act because markets are weak and because there's a high volatility, but inflation remains persistent and the economic uh, elements are not good but not, uh, but not bad, then it can create a worse policy mistake, which is to cut rates now but then have to hike rates in the future. And that, as we remember from the, the past, can generate a much larger problem in markets and in the real economy. Daniel Lacaye, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. The Biden administration continues its efforts to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East. President Biden met with Jordan's King Abdullah, while Secretary of State Antony Blinken held calls with Qatari and Egyptian ministers. Joining me now to discuss the latest updates in the region is Gerard Felitti, Middle East Affairs Analyst and Attorney specializing in international law. Gerard, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you again. To begin, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller today saying, quote, we're at a critical moment for the region, adding that escalation is in no one's interest. Where do you see things going from here? Right now, what we know is that Iran has made statements that it is definitively going to attack Israel. Its foreign minister has been making the rounds of European uh, delegates and making that statement, preparing the world basically for what will be expected to be much like the last Iranian attack, largely relying on drones and, and other technology to attack Israel. Uh, so the, the de-escalation right now doesn't look very feasible since Iran has made it its position both for domestic propaganda consumption and on the international scene that it intends to take action against Israel. The only question is what form of action this will take, how long it will last, and what happens after that. On that note, former President Trump is saying there could be an attack tonight by Iran. What do you make of that prediction and what can we expect to see from Tehran? We know that also President Biden was in the Situation Room today and that we've been moving U.S. assets to respond to any attack. We have seen an attack on a U.S. military base in Iraq today uh, by militants firing two rockets. So this is sort of the preamble to what we're going to see. In terms of when to expect an attack, it's anyone's guess. Uh, the earliest that would have been likely was over the weekend or even tonight. Uh, but Iran is not going to telegraph its uh, intentions more clearly than that. And it will strike at the time and place of its choosing, probably within the next two weeks, but there's no guarantee uh, of any timetable. And this has come as the UN says nine UNRWA staff members will be fired over possible involvement in the October 7th attack on Israel. What is your reaction to this? Well, it's, it should not come as a surprise to anyone who's been following the news that UNRWA has been intimately involved with Hamas. Many of its employees in, in, in Gaza were actually involved in the attacks crossing the border. One of them was holding a hostage in his house. So this is not something new. UNRWA has been a problem of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel uh, hate for decades uh, and is an institution that really needs to be revamped. But this is also a systemic problem at the United Nations, which has taken explicitly anti-Israel positions, singling it out like no other country in the world and basically siding with terror groups. What's interesting as well is the United Nations, which is overall in charge of the International Criminal Court, seems to be happy with Iran's actions, even though Iran has been doing everything possible to violate international law and attack civilian populations all over the world. Hmm. And how do developments like this impact the war in Gaza? Uh, they, they, they don't make it any easier. This, uh, this heightened state of alert makes it more difficult to come to a ceasefire and more difficult for uh, the hostages to be brought home. However, it is an ending of a war when one side wins militarily, and that is what Israel is, is aiming to do, uh, and it is achieving that in Gaza. So sooner rather than later, whether it's by capitulation of Hamas, by ceasefire agreement, or by Israel achieving its objectives, we can expect that the situation in Gaza will die down, even though it may escalate in, in Lebanon or in other parts of the Middle East. And Gerard, what do you see as the timeline for a potential ceasefire, or are we closer to a regional war? I think we are not likely to see a ceasefire anytime soon. I think every time we see increased hostility, especially on the part of Iran, it postpones any ability to bring about a meaningful ceasefire or resolution to the conflict in Gaza. In terms of a regional war, I also don't think that that's likely. I think we will see more of what we have already seen, which is targeted Iranian attacks by Iran and its proxies, terror proxies, uh, against the state of Israel, which hopefully will meet the same fate as the last wave of attacks, meaning that they will be resoundingly defeated. 
However, the escalation in the regional rhetoric is concerning because this is still an escalation. It brings instability to a region that is home to millions of civilians and such a huge economic partner to the West and to China that we really need to stabilize the situation and not to keep fomenting this unrest. Gerard Filetti, Middle East Affairs Analyst and Attorney specializing in international law. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure as always. Thank you. A group of congressmen are praising Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin for reversing a plea deal made with alleged 9-11 terrorists last week. But some families of the victims say they want closure and accountability. One group representing families thanked Austin for listening to their voices. Another group said it feels betrayed for not being consulted. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has reactions to Austin's move. Congressman praising Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called his decision to revoke the 9-11 plea deal a necessary step towards justice. The deal would have spared the accused mastermind of the 9-11 terror attacks and two alleged accomplices from the death penalty. The deal would have also avoided a lengthy trial. Austin said the responsibility for such a significant decision should rest with him. House Speaker Mike Johnson on X said the Biden-Harris administration made the right move and called for justice for victims' families. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senator Tom Cotton released a joint statement, commending Austin and calling the plea deal disgraceful. Representative Brandon Williams expressed gratitude towards Austin and said failing to hold the terrorists accountable would send the wrong message. Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis of New York called for the death penalty in a trial date. Chair of 9-11 Families United Terry Strada said Austin's decision was a relief for many of the victims' families. The group 9-11 Justice says Americans and the families of nearly 3,000 victims deserve to know every detail of the 2001 terrorist attacks. Another group called September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows said although a plea deal wasn't what they were hoping for, it would give a path to finality. The ACLU, which is supportive of a plea deal, has vowed to take legal action against Austin's interjection. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Following the disputed election in Venezuela, the U.S. is in contact with Brazil, Mexico and Colombia on a path moving forward. Meanwhile, protests erupt leading to numerous arrests. NTD's David Lamb tells us more. Where we are today is we are in close contact with our partners in, uh, in the region, uh, especially with Brazil, Mexico and Colombia uh, about a path forward. Protests have erupted across Venezuela since last Monday after electoral authorities declared President Nicolas Maduro had won a third term in office with 51% of the vote, extending the Chavista movement's quarter-century rule. But the country's opposition says its tally shows another candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, to be the winner, saying he likely received 67% of the vote, winning by a margin of nearly 4 million votes, more than double the support of the incumbent Venezuelan president. The question about respecting the will of the Venezuelan people, and as we concluded, and you saw in the statement that we released last week, when you look at the tallies that the opposition made public, um, it's clear that even if every outstanding vote came back from Maduro, it wouldn't be enough to overcome the advantage that um, uh, Edmundo Gonzalez uh, had. Venezuelan security forces are targeting those who they say committed violent crimes during recent protests over the disputed election in an operation informally called Knock Knock. Maduro told supporters on Saturday that around 2,000 people had been arrested during the protest. Human Rights Watch reported at least 20 people have been killed. In San Francisco, while holding flags and banners, dozens sang in unison at a rally over the weekend. I'm 27, but I have, have been protesting this regime since 2002, so they, I was six years old. Mexicans in Ciudad Juarez also gathered at the border bridge between U.S.-Mexico, demanding that Maduro step down and Gonzalez to be elected winner. Demonstrators blocked vehicle access to the border entrance for one hour as the Mexican police and National Guard guarded the area. Similar protests have backed Maduro as well. The U.S. and a number of other countries have backed Gonzalez as the winner, while others, including European nations, have called for the release of electoral rolls. Brazil's government, like Colombia and Mexico, has called for the release of full voting results following Venezuela's July 28th election. David Lamb, NTD News. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, plenty going on at the Paris Olympics today, so let's start right there. As Simone Biles took silver in the floor exercise this morning to conclude her run here. The big question is, will she be back in 2028? 
Well, she hasn't ruled that out. Now, she is 27, which made her the oldest all-around champion in more than 70 years. Uh, but clearly, she's still at the top of her game, and obviously the fans will certainly love to see her continue in Los Angeles. In any case, she leaves these games with three golds and a silver. Now, that was in today's floor routine, which is her signature event. Now, she actually stepped out of bounds a couple of times, which cost her more than half a point, and she lost by less than a tenth of a point, so it really cost her gold. But getting silver at the Olympics, obviously nothing to sneeze at, and that's her 11th Olympic medal. That's now tied for the second most by a female gymnast in Olympic history. And it should be honest to know that teammate Jordan Childs also medaled. She got bronze, so congratulations to those two. Now, in women's Olympic boxing, there's an ongoing controversy here with two of the boxers over their eligibility. There's also a bit of a war of words now between Olympic boxing's former governing body and the IOC. What is the latest here? Well, the latest is that the International Boxing Association, or IBA, came out today to say that those two boxers took blood tests back in March of 2023 in preparation for the Boxing World Championships, those tests revealed that their chromosomes made them ineligible, so they didn't let them compete there. Now, they said they sent that information to the IOC. I'm not sure what the IOC did with it, but the IOC has said there was never any doubt about the two of them being women. They also said the IBA is a discredited organization and that the tests were ordered on arbitrary grounds. Now, it should be noted, every sport has a world governing body that determines international rules, including eligibility. The IBA used to be boxing's uh, world governing body for for these Olympic Games. They aren't anymore. Now, the IOC is essentially handling it for these games. There seems to be some blad, bad blood between these two organizations. Now, having covered this story for the past week, I'll say this. I've seen no evidence or reports that suggest that either of these two boxers has had some kind of sex, cha sorry, sex change procedure, uh, which has been a very popular opinion out there. Well, shifting gears to college football, the coaches' preseason poll came out today with Georgia back on top and Ohio State second. Were there any surprises in there? Well, it's always strange not to have Alabama somewhere in the top three with all their titles recently. They're ranked fifth in this one. I'm sure that's partly due to Nick Saban's retirement and their somewhat underwhelming season last year, even despite they won the SEC. This is also the first poll with a new conference realignment in place where Oklahoma and Texas are in the SEC, while 10 of the Pac-12 teams left for the Big Ten. 10, the Big 12, and the ACC. So eight of the top nine ranked teams are represented by the two super conferences, that's the Big 10 and the SEC, with the other being Notre Dame, which is essentially an independent. Meanwhile, the ACC's highest ranked team is Florida State at 10, while the Big 12 newcomer Utah is their highest at number 13. Now, of course, these preseason polls are complete guesses. We'll see where everyone's at in December when we get our first 12-team playoff. Well, circling back to the Olympic schedule for tomorrow, what are some of the major events happening and where are we in the medal count? Yeah, another big track and big track and field day tomorrow. We've got the women's 200 meter sprint. Team USA's Gabrielle Thomas should be a favorite to win gold in that one. Meanwhile, the women's soccer team will face Germany for a spot in the gold medal game. Now that will take place at noon Eastern time. We'll also see the team, men's Team USA basketball face Brazil in the quarterfinals. That'll be at 3.30 Eastern time. And as far as medal count, China won two gold medals today to the U.S.'s one. That was Valerie Allman winning the women's discus for Team USA. So China has a slight lead in, lead in golds, 21 to 20. Overall, the medal, the U.S. has the most medals with 78, China is second with 53, and the host country, France, is third with 46. Well, Davis, always thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. In Paris, Olympic fans can easily walk from one contest to another while visiting central Paris at the same time. It's a very pleasant experience for many supporters. And the French are outperforming their usual medal score in this year's Olympic Games. Fans in Paris told NTD's international correspondent, David Vives, the Games have exceeded their expectations. Many French people and Parisians have complained over the past month about what life would be like in the capital during the Olympic Games amidst political tensions, potential unrest, security risks and construction works. However, things look different now as French athletes have started collecting medal after medal. The mood has lifted. After swimmer Louis Marchand's victory in the butterfly final, France is now third in the Games medal table with 44 medals, including 12 gold medals behind the US and China. China. This is a record in the medal scoreboard for French athletes. If we had to that a shining sun, there's nothing for the French to be really grumpy about in the capital now.
I think we were all happily surprised by the organization. Because we're Parisians, we expected it to be a bit more complicated. And no, it's great. It's a change from the usual Parisians' grumpy faces. Usually, it's a bit of a drag. Frankly, it's very joyful. It's very nice. It also feels like we're with family. There's a really good atmosphere and lovely people. Everyone was expecting things to go wrong, and in the end, people are feeling good. There's a beautiful spirit in these games. There's no tension between supporters and fans of different teams. No tension at all. You can feel that people are coming together to have a good time. The experience of the city, heavily secured by 45,000 police officers, seems different for tourists and residents. Fencing contests in the Grand Palais, biking at Place de la Concorde, archery at the Invalide. Many supporters praise the decision to not only hold contests in stadiums but in different iconic places and monuments in the capital. The large pedestrian zone allows short and long walks for those who want to visit the capital. I'm coming back. I've not been here for maybe 20 years and, and yeah, it's, it's reminded me why it is such a, a beautiful city and I need to come more. Good to have the venues, so Champ de Mar under the Tour Eiffel, Place de la Concorde here, etc. It's, it's, it's made the, the, the iconic landmarks part of the games. It's and very excellent. easy to be a pedestrian around here. So it's good to get from place to place, it's easy. I feel like it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Paris is such a pretty city too, so it's really nice to take pictures and explore. The Olympics will end on August 11th. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And that's all for today's news. For round the clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.